<laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to my colleagues in France and in Germany. It's now time to open our symposium. I am Takeshi Imai of Hosei University and will preside it today. This symposium, which is hosted by IATS or International Association of Traffic and Safety Sciences, is an occasion for an international discussion about the legal problems as well as their social backgrounds that should be solved before the level four and more techniques are to be allowed to use on the public road. Before starting this symposium, let me take a minute to go over some technical information and rules. This symposium will be recorded by IATS and later uploaded on its web page. During the symposium, I would ask you to kindly switch off your camera and be on mute, except in order to ask a question after each presentation of the speakers or to present your opinion as a panel discussion. Meanwhile, you are free to write your message in the chat room of the Zoom. Those rules are a preventive way for communication jam on the net. Today or tonight, we have four distinguished speakers. You can see their faces and the names on the Zoom. Okay, uh, I would like to ask them to do a simple self-introduction. Okay, um, first, Miss Jessica Uguccioni from the UK. Are you there? Not yet? All right. So first, Miss Mirja Perdman, Richter from Germany. Please uh, do your self-introduction. Minute, please. Uh, it's mute. Mirja, could you? Uh, okay, that's right. Okay. え、皆様こんばんは。私はフェルマミリアと申します。私は、あの、今、あの、裁判、裁判官で、あの、え、ドイツの最高検察官所で、え、勤務しております。それは、それでいいと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。<笑> Uh, Sihar Jan experience of staying longer in Japan to study Japanese law and Japanese social background. So he's very good at speaking Japanese. Thank you very much. And the next, uh, also from Germany, Professor Eric Andres Hirkendorf. Could you please self introduction? Yes, good morning, everybody. My Japanese is not so good at the moment, therefore I will speak <laughs> English. I'm a professor of criminal law and legal informatics at the University of Würzburg. Um, I've been a member of several committees on artificial intelligence and law, especially on automotive uh, technology and law for the German government. And I'm happy to be here and listen to you and learn from you. Good wishes to Japan. Thank you very much. And the next, uh, Professor Jean-Christophe Loda from France. Please uh, uh, give us uh, your self-introduction. Okay, thank you very much, Takeyoshi. Um, I think I have to, to say konnichiwa because uh, in France it is a, yes. we are in the morning. Um, my Japanese mm -hmm. is very bad. My English is very bad too. So um, let me, I apologize for my terrible French accent also. Um, I am a professor in business law in the Lyon faculty. And it's a great pleasure to, to see all of you and to see Aya Oshawa uh, that visit us a uh, few months ago before, before the crisis. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Miss Jessica Uguccioni from the UK Law Commission. Hello. Uh, please uh, give us a self introduction. Yes, hello everybody, and apologies for being late. I had a trouble with uh, my internet. <laughs> Not at all. the way with these things. It is my great honor to be here. My name is Jessica Guccioni. I'm the lead lawyer for the Automated Vehicles Review in the UK at the Law Commission. Um, and we are advising the UK government about changes to automated vehicles legislation. Thank you very much. Okay. And also, uh, I would like to introduce two key persons. Um, they are Professor Aya Osawa of Civil Law and Consumer Protection Law and the lecturer, Miss Caroline Ruberton. You can see the two on the Zoom. 
Both of them belong to Hose University and are going to help interpret today's interventions and the discussions or at least summarize the key point either from French or Japanese to Japanese or English and vice versa. For Japanese translation, look it in the chat room. For English, look it in the subtitled transcript. Okay, um, at the moment, do you have any questions for uh, the major by which we are going to start the, uh, uh, the symposium? Okay, right. Okay, so uh, let us back to the program. Okay, Miss Ugchoni, uh, Jessica, could you begin your presentation? Absolutely. Um, has it been uploaded? Not yet. Um, uh, okay, Jimmy uh, Kokunokata, Jessica san no upload to the Kimaska. Hi, so so much, Kudas. Just wait a moment, Jessica. Thank you. Well, before starting, uh, I would like to tell you that today, as many as uh, nearly 100 persons are participating to this symposium. That is so wonderful. Yes, and I yeah. was hearing from many, many jurisdictions. Oh, okay, I guess while right. we wait for the slides to come up, I can start with the introduction that is in yes, the slide. Yes and speak to it. Um, so many of you may not be familiar with the Law Commission. It is a very specialist agency set up by Parliament, uh, especially mm. to reform and change legislation in the UK. It was set up in 1965. My organization looks at the legislation and laws of England and Wales. We are also mm. have a, having a sister organization in Scotland and the project about self-driving vehicles about automated vehicles is a joint effort between the Scottish Law Commission and the Law Commission here in England and Wales. And the interesting way about how we work is that we are independent of government. So we advise government, but we are independent. And I see the slides are coming up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, please please uh, continue. Yes, absolutely. And um, the way we're independent. And so we have uh, the judiciary as part of our um, hierarchy and setup. So the chair person of our organization is a court of appeal judge. And that gives us that kind of independence in respect to the recommendations we make to government. But we also work very closely with them. And indeed our project is sponsored by the UK Center for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. And we have a very close working relationship with them. Um, and um, we, they have asked us, they have been the um, UK government uh, department, the Department for Transport, um, has asked us to develop and assist them in developing a legal framework for self-driving uh, vehicles. So if I may uh, possibly take over, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's not allowing me. Can I be given rights to click through? Oh, uh, just wait a moment. Yes. I can just prompt about going to the next slide if that's okay. If okay, that's okay. Problem. So, yeah, and the next one too, please. Some page. Yes, perfect. Yes. And so we. Uh, work through consultation. We have done three cycles mm. of consultation so far. We started the project in 2018 and we focused on safety assurance and we've uh, produced consultations also on the integration of public transport. And then the current consultation, which is still live, is um, was published just in December of last year. And it's our final consultation before we make recommendations for legislation at the end of this year. So uh, the, fin the final consultation that we are doing will close in the middle of March and it covers the priority areas that we see as being essential in order to deliver the deployment of self-driving vehicles on our roads beyond uh, mere testing. If we may move to the next slide. 
4ページお願いします。So the topics that we cover as priority areas are the legal definition and the meaning of self-driving, and that goes into the questions of,、uh, that we talk about a lot in these debates of SA Level 3, for example, and those kinds of issues. So, so we talk about the meaning of self-driving. We then look at the safety assurance scheme, both before、uh, the vehicle can be allowed onto the road, but very importantly, we look at safety while the vehicle is in use and during its lifetime, because of course it can change Very significantly over the course of its existence with software updates and changes. So that's a very key part. We also look at the different legal actors.、Uh, if this was an automated vehicles movie, who would be the、um, main actors, you know, the,、um, the key players in it? So that is something that we consider both on the user side as well as behind the scenes、um, directing these vehicles as、uh, fleet operations. We then also look at the civil and the criminal responsibility that attaches、um, around things that might happen with a self driving vehicle. And we have a very focused area on data and access to data.、Uh, we focus on the aspects which are absolutely necessary to make the overall scheme work. If we can move to the next slide, please. So I'll be sharing four aspects today. I'm very conscious of time. And so I will.、Um, You know, we'll get through as much as we can, and I have made quite a full presentation, but it's more for your reference as well. And、uh, if you're interested、uh, to, to refer to it afterwards, but、um, I will share how we are adapting the UK legal framework and give you the main overview structure of how we are thinking about automated vehicles. The second aspect that we're looking at is the legal status of human users of automated vehicles. We often talk about drivers. In AVs today, but does that make sense in a future where we are actually hoping the vehicle will drive itself? And we consider questions like how safe is safe enough? How do we help the regulators decide when a vehicle crosses the threshold from being not safe and not allowable to something that we are comfortable as a society to have on our roads? So that is a very important and difficult question about public acceptance. And then finally, we consider the scope of criminal responsibility, which is one of the most difficult aspects. And it's related, of course, to some of the conversations we will have had before about the key legal actors. So, if we may move to the next slide. So, the first aspect is how are we adapting the UK legal framework for automated vehicles? If we can move to the next slide. There are two core paths to automation that really shape the way that we think about this. We think we need to enable both vehicles that involve an element of human driving. So, for example, automated lane keeping systems like ALKS that are being very recently approved in Japan、um, as well、uh, with、uh, Honda, which is fantastic.、Um, those kinds of systems i s a way for self driving to happen on our roads. So, you still have Somebody in the vehicle that will manually drive for part of the journey, potentially. So, that is one use case. The other major use case is vehicles that could even travel empty and will have no <clears throat> responsible adult in the vehicle. And we think it's absolutely important to enable that type of use case. But the legal framework to help that is very different to the legal framework that you need. In terms of responsibilities for vehicles that still have a responsible adult in them. If we can move to the next slide, you will see this colorful representation. It contains much detail, but the key idea you will see at the top we have the concept of an automated driving system entity. That is the body that develops the automated driving system. The software and the hardware that enables the vehicle to drive itself. And that entity is going to have to take responsibility and put that、um, ADS, the automated driving system, forward for approval by the regulator. So they will be making the safety case that the system is appropriate for the locations where it's going to be used and that it meets all the specifications that are set out. So that is independent of the use case. Every automated vehicle must have such an entity behind it. But that is where um, the uh, uh, things split into two main branches. 
we think that an automated vehicle that is approved for use on roads can either be approved for lawful use with a user in charge. That user in charge is that responsible adult that can and might need to drive for part of a journey and has important responsibilities that do not relate to driving, like making sure children wear seat belts or have insurance or things that are things drivers currently do, but that are not about the dynamic and changing um, driving of a vehicle. So that is one type of vehicle. So that, for example, could be the Hondas, the Teslas, they come in this category. The other category of vehicle is the vehicles which might carry only passengers. They need a licensed fleet operator. So that is an entity that looks after the operation of a vehicle. So if it is a ride hailing service, like the systems we know today, like Lyft, Didi, Uber, for example, if a customer uses an automated vehicle delivering such a service, then we need that entity to make sure that the vehicle is maintained properly, um, is roadworthy, that the sensors work. And we need to also ensure that if there is a problem, that that entity can step in and make sure they deal with it. So that's all I'm going to say um, about this general structure for now. There are some further um, uh, aspects to it, depending on the particular use case. Of course, if you carry goods, you will have different obligations than if you carry people. But that is a second tier of obligations. The licensed fleet operator, overall, the key responsibilities include supervising vehicles for every vehicle, as well as these non-dynamic driving tasks I mentioned. Next slide, please. Just wait a moment, Jessica. Uh, Mr. Kono Kata, Zen Gama in Kyoto, Mr. Kurosai. すみません、一度共有会を貸していただきます。はい。じゃあ、それでは、マメント。オッケー。いかがでしょうか。あ、サンキューです。サンキューマメント。そう、プリーズコンティニューですか。Thank I think we might have uh, skipped, um, yes, to, so now we are at the legal status of the users of automated vehicles. So I mentioned that one of the very important use cases is where the person in the vehicle might still need to drive part of the time. But of course, that poses big challenges in terms of human factors and uh, human intervention responsibility. Next slide, please. The key recommendations um, that we are proposing so far at the Law Commissions in respect of criminal responsibility for driving are that there should be a very clear and bright line rule distinguishing the responsibilities uh, when the self-driving vehicle is in automated mode and driving itself versus situations where the human user is themselves driving and is a driver. We think that if you are relaxing driver distraction legislation and you are telling people it is okay to, uh, to not be paying attention to the road and, for example, to look at emails or watch a movie, you cannot then make them criminally responsible if something goes wrong during that time when the automated system is engaged. That is a fundamental principle of how we are thinking about this. Next slide, please. We have therefore suggested creating a new legal category to really clarify the fact that when the automated driving system is turned on and the vehicle is in self-driving mode, the person in the vehicle is, from a legal perspective, no longer a driver. We call this category a user in charge. So for example, if the vehicle was involved in a collision or some form of other incident, then the user in charge is clearly not responsible for that eventuality and they have no obligation to monitor the vehicle and its performance. Next slide, please. That puts a very great emphasis on the transition demand. So we say that the user in charge does not have to be paying attention to the road and to the mode of driving, but there is one very critical exception to this. They need to be receptive and responsive 
to a takeover request that might be issued by the system. So that is something that you can be aware of in advance. You know what to expect if it happens. And we focus on the regulation to make sure that the transition demand is appropriate. So it has to be multi-sensory. We think it should be, of course, visual, audio, and also vibrations, uh, haptic feedback to really make sure you bring the person back into the loop of driving. And we have considered carefully the UN's um, developments with the automated lane keeping system regulation to help us clarify and identify what we are looking for in terms of the appropriate transition demand. And at the end of that transition period for automated lane keeping on motorway, it is 10 seconds, for example, has been agreed. At the end of that 10 seconds, the user in charge that was had no responsibility for driving then becomes a driver, whether or not they actually take over, they are deemed to be a driver and they gain the responsibilities of a driver to make sure the vehicle is in a safe position. Next slide, please. This is a major shift, of course, because we rely so much on drivers today uh, in terms of accountability and responsibility for the manner of driving. So criminal prosecutions are common if something goes wrong in a self-driving vehicle which has this mode with a user in charge there may not be a human to blame and that is going to be something very challenging in terms of societal acceptance next slide please this brings me to how safe is safe enough i'm conscious of time so i'm going to go through this at a more high level um, than we do of course in our paper next slide please we consider four possible standards of how safe is safe enough if it could kindly click through uh, this slide. So the first is a risk benefit analysis, as safe as re reasonably practicable. So you measure the risk and the cost of averting the risk. Next uh, click, please. We also consider the standard we apply in road traffic today, which is very different. We consider what would a competent and careful human driver do? And that's what we compare as the standard. It is, it is difficult because a robot, a computer, might be better at some things and worse at different things. So it's a challenging standard. Next slide, next click, please. Also, we consider the idea that the vehicle should not itself cause an accident. Um, so that is something that has been proposed as the responsibility sensitive safety by Intel Mobileye, for example, and it has been developed um, at an IEEE level, and it's a very interesting standard trying to define negligence from a mathematical formula point of view and looking at the safety envelope around the vehicle. So that is one method. And uh, clicking through, please, to the next slide. And the last is the positive risk balance, which industry has been very much putting forward, which is the idea that any improvement in road traffic safety should be enough to allow self-driving vehicles on the road or perhaps a measurable improvement. So if today in the UK, for example, we kill over 1,700 people on the roads each year, if in self-driving we can halve that number, so half the people die, then that's good enough and we should be introducing. So it's enough to see those different standards, each one makes sense on its own terms, but they can lead to different conclusions depending which one you apply. And there is no single standard that is in itself more correct than the others. They all have their merits. And so what we say is that in the end, it is a political decision. Next slide, please. Really, the question of how safe is safe enough is something that society is going to have to accept and deal with. And so it is ultimately a political question that needs to be informed with solid and expert evidence. But it is not something that can only be determined in a technical manner. We suggest it needs to be transparent, that there are uh, set-offs between different interests. And there are important ethical questions, which I know Professor Imai has been very interested in researching and we will be touching on today also with our um, wonderful uh, other speakers. If mm. you may move to the next slide, please. 
Um, I was going to say a bit about the criminal liability, but in the interest of time, I think I will uh, stop here unless Professor Imai uh, thinks there is time in the agenda, but um, we can come to the criminal aspects during the panel discussion. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Bermat, for very impressive presentation. Okay, uh, is there any, any person to ask her at the moment? Feel free to ask her a question. Okay, so before I'm um, waiting for another participant to raise your raise a uh, question to her, may I just uh, ask you? Um, well, um, I'm very interested in the creating the new concept of user in charge. So, um, how have you come up with the unique and innovative concept? Yes, I think um, the idea is that there might be different operational modes within a single journey so that mm. someone can be a driver and the driver is such a fundamental element of road traffic regulation. Mm. Um, it was very interesting to us that although uh, we are doing a lot of work to bring self-driving onto the roads and make it possible through regulation, there was less attention to the need to change our ideas about the responsibility of users of these of these vehicles. So even in the UN discussions that I participate in with uh, many uh, colleagues from all over the world, including Japan, of course, even when we speak about self-driving, we have very blunt tools. We talk about drivers and we talk about users, but we don't really go into more detail in our international instruments and in our conversations about the different and important status of people that might need to drive at some stage of a journey, but mm. may absolutely have no responsibilities when the system is engaged. And we were worried that if we just maintain the simple term driver, as does the automated lane keeping systems regulation, for example, there mm. might be confusion about the responsibilities because you are telling that person that they can be distracted. They don't need to be paying attention to the road. Mm. And to say that that is true for a driver is mm. from our point of view problematic because drivers by definition from a legal point of view need to be paying attention to the road mm. and are responsible for the dynamic driving. Thank you very much, very clear. Is there any person who would like to ask her? Oh, uh, oh, okay, Professor Hilgendorf, please. Yes, I want to ask another question. It was a wonderful presentation. I will ask one short question. You were talking about users and drivers. I wonder whether in the English system you have also the concept of a holder. The holder of a car, meaning someone who is responsible for the car in use, but not necessar necessarily is driving the car. In, for example, in Germany, it's a holder of the car who, uh, who is liable, not the driver. What do you think yes. about that? Yes, absolutely. Every legal system has different uh, players and actors. And of course, we also have the registered keeper concept. Okay. So that absolutely exists um, as well, mm. but they tend to be more a secondary figure mm. of liability mm. in the mm. background. Uh, but we also think they can have a useful role in the automated vehicle allocation of responsibilities. Um, but uh, what we were more concerned with was when there is a person in the vehicle for example, that might be driving sometimes to make sure that the label and responsibilities of a driver do not apply for the entire journey, especially when you turn the automated driving system on. So there can be concurrent responsibility. So also the holder is responsible for insurance, is also responsible mm. for those aspects, but usually the driver also has those responsibility. And mm. we need to make sure that it is clear that for that portion of the journey, the responsibility for dynamic driving doesn't apply, but they can also have responsibilities like the holder. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugendorf, Mr. Professor. It's a very, very important question. So we have to uh, further discuss at some, uh, later. Okay. Uh, may I say one thing, Professor? Yes. Yes. My, yes. Um, I, I think it would be remiss of me not to mention, of course, that um, the concept of user in charge was also, uh, it's, it has many similarities with the SAE level three when people talk about fallback ready mm. user. 
Mm -hmm. um, but we do not limit it to level three. Mm -hmm. It has similarity because, of course, there is a transition, but we are very clear it's not only about SAE levels. It can be for any mm -hmm. uh, extent of technology. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a, a very important element for us. That's a point that I would like to ask from you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so th thank you, Jessica. So next, um, Dr. and Richter Mirja Feldman, could you begin to your presentation? Okay. Mina um, sama, konbanwa. ことしもこのシンポジウムに発表させていただいて大公営で心から感謝しております。え、今回ドイツから参加しているなんて少し残念に思いますが、やはりあの世界のどこかでもあ、人々の生活活躍などがその怖い新型コロナウイルスの影響
by programming the car correspondingly is either up to the manufacturer without any detailed legal margin, or if it is up to the customer to choose freely between different setting options given by the car software. Under such circumstances, the criminal law approach is of importance when it comes to judging facts such as accidents that happened in the past, and it has to be determined and the framework, for example, of a criminal investigation, whether the subject who is responsible for the choice of how to solve the dilemma has committed a criminal offense, such as bodily harm or intentional killing or manslaughter, as you might say in the UK. Furthermore, the issue of whether a certain action or choice can incur criminal liability is also at stake when an attorney advises an enterprise on how to avoid criminal liability. In this context, the majority of the German authors proceed to examine two or three settings whereby intentional conduct coy, is always presumed. First, they assess whether a human driver would incur criminal liability, for example, for manslaughter in a certain dilemma scenario. That is my, um, this, um, in this chart, column two. And then secondly, but only rarely, it's assessed with what the answer regarding criminal liability would be if the choice was made ex ante by the driver. For, for example, if the driver had cho chosen between several settings in the software before he starts using the car. And last but not le the least, they check what the outcome regarding liability would be if the choice was predetermined by the responsible persons at the manufacturer. Um, could they help be liable? Liable, and that is what co uh, the last column here on the right uh, is about. So the first chart we are seeing here now in Japanese um, contains scenarios in which the basic dilemma situation can, can be described as a choice between the death of the automatic vehicle user on the one hand and killing one or other or more third parties on the other. In contrast, the second chart we will see later, is about um, a situation where uh, no life threat to the user X of the automated vehicle, but um, to several, the lives of several third parties is at stake. I do not want to consider scenarios here that involve so-called qualitative differences, that is age, health, race, between the potential victims of the accident. They might play a role in the current and very, very sad discussion on tri triage when doctors facing shortage of ventilators have to choose who among the incoming severely ill COVID-19 patients will be admitted for treatment and who not. Because in this context, at least a ponderation of different factors might give a clue to different chances of survival. But regarding automatic driving, firstly, the senses are, as far as I know, not able to recognize these characteristics yet. Um, whereas doctors have the living patient just in front of them. And secondly, I believe with the ethical committee in Germany that a preference rule based on qualitative, qualitative criteria is not permissible in the context of automatic driving, because at least for the purpose of our reflections here, we will assume that the probability of instant death is the same for all of the potential victims. And in this context, a decision based on age, gender, race, religion, or whatever, would end up in a clear unlawful discrimination, which our constitution in Germany does not permit. Mm. I will go through these scenarios with you, skipping the middle column um, due to our time limitations. Yeah, so we will talk about the first あの、道路法上の規則を順守しておしていることを、あの、当該行為と結果に関する行為を有していることを前提として
one. X が利用、それあの場合によって運転する自動車がさらに進行すると道路の上に横をたわっていて自転車に乗っている Y を引いてしまう。これ Y を引くことを避けようとするならば X 自身が、うん、死亡するだろうという事例です。まず、ドイツの多くの刑法学者と同様に、私も今、X が運転した場合に、X に殺人罪が成立するかどうかを検討したいんです。X の行動が殺人罪を規定している212以上の構成要件に該当するかどうかといえば、運転するという行為と、あ他人が死亡したという結果が存在し、うん、当該、行為と結果との間の因果関係も認められますが、ドイツの多くの刑法学者は、因果関係の他に書かれざる客観的構成要件予想として、客観的結果、貴族、ドイツ語でオブジェクティブ・ツーレヒノンと言いますの存在が必要だと解しています。その条件はこの例では認められないと思います。より詳しく言えば、犯罪の結果が行為者の行為に帰属可能でなければ、当該犯罪は成立しないんです。そこで、行為者の実行行為についても特別な本質が要求されます。それは、行為が許容されない危険を創出するということです。先に述べたように、この事例で,では X が全ての交通規則を遵守していますので、X は強要されない危険を創出したと言えず、結果として Y の死はあ自然な観点から見る場合とは異なりますが、それを X の構成要件的な行為に帰属することはできず、結果として X の行為は殺人罪の構成要件に該当しないことに。なるんですさて、この第一次の例に少し変更しましょう。今回あのに,に行きましょう、うん。今回、X が運転者でなく自動車、自動運転モードで走っている車の単なる利,利用者であるとしましょう。そうすると、事件の場面で X の実行行為がないんですから、車のコードをプログラミングで設定した製造者の責任者に殺人罪が成立するかどうかを聞いてみましょう。それは今の,の右側になります。この場合でも C という構成要件結果が製造者の行為により発生されたと言えるにもかかわらず、クルマがすべての規則を遵守していたから、この事例に関しても、客観的結果規則性が欠けると言えるんでしょう。結論としては、製造者に責任を問わないことだと思われます。次に、今、2。A、あの中、中、A、つまり、あの、ケースに行きましょう。X が利用、それ、あの、場合によって、あの、うん、その、右の、縦の列に、運転、え、違う、あの、逆です。利用は、あの、右の縦列の例に与えますけど、けれども、あの、運転してるのは、あの、その、その、運転しかある場合に当たります。あの、X が利用、それから運転している SUV 大型車両の前方でガソリンを運行しているトラックが爆発した。X、それともその車両がさらに進行すれば X が死亡するだろう。これを
避けるべく、X、それともその車両は反対車線へと展開した。そのため、そこを走行してたモーターバイクの運転者である Y が死亡したというものです。さて、X が運転する場合には、ドイツの通説によると、X が反対車線に行って第三者を死亡させるのは、212以上の殺人罪の構成要件に該当します。さらに、支配的な理解からすると、違法世相規約自由も認まれません。詳しく言えば、34条に定められている正当化、緊急避難が、否定される理由は、保護液、つまり X の生命が侵害される保護液、つまり Y の生命を本質的に凌駕することという34条の要件は、この事例のような生命と生命とが対立する事例では充足されないということです。しかし、後遺者が自分の生命も、もしくは、うん、親族の生命に対する危険がある場面で、こういった危険回避しようとして、第三者を殺してし,しまうならば、通説によると35条の面積的、えー、緊急避難の要件が、うん、充足され、X は処罰されなないことになりますそれに対して同じ事例において製造者の過罰性を検討しようとすれば構成要件該当性と違法性はもちろん先のケースとは異なり責任も存在するとの理解が支配的です。製造者に面積的緊急避難が成立しないのは、車両の利用者は製造者の親族じゃないからです。次は 2B の例ですが、2A の例事例との違いは、X だけじゃなく、あのさらに2人の乗,車乗客が車に乗っていることで、その以外の状況は、2A と変わらないことにしましょう。運転者たる X の責任については、ドイツの通説によって 2A の事例と同様です。すなわち、面積的緊急避難が認められます。施造者が懲罰できるかどうかについては 2A の事例と違って議論があります。5条の面積的緊急避難が成立しない点については議論がないと言えますよ。しかしながら、諜報機的緊急避難の適用性が問題となります。この事例の特性は、多数の生命を救助しようとして、少数の生命を犠牲する行為ということですが、そういう状況において、情報機的緊急避難を固定するの少数意見です。なお、その流派の中には、救助行為を行わない場合、みんなが死んでしまうといった危険状況、危険共同体とドイツ語で、えー、言います。においてのみ、情報機、緊急規範、えー、緊急避難適用ができるとする意見も少なくはありません。So now I will <laughs> come back to English.、Um, so not to exclude my, my other colleagues from the debate here. And I think、um, I will,、um, because I'm very conscient of time as well. I skip the chart number two. We can have a short look at it and just resume,、uh, summarize the、uh, results if you are okay with, this,、uh, with that,、um, Takeyoshi san.、Um, so then I would, could you please move to chart two? Yeah,、uh, next, please.
there is next yes yeah i i oh no 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 back <laughs> please yes. yes i just explained that there is that here there is not uh, the, the difference with chart number one is that there is no um life thread to the user of the automatic vehicle here but um the nevertheless the situations are also very uh, similar so summarizing the results of the two charts According to the majority opinion in Germany, only the vehicle's axis onward journey initiated manually by the driver or pre-installed by the software is permissible from a legal point of view. Even if the onward journey ends up in the death or injury of another person, this result, kekka in Japanese, cannot be attributed to the offender mm. according to the criteria of the so-called theory mm. of objective attribution. The reason is the following. Assuming that the driver or the vehicle have been observing the traffic rules, no legally disapproved risk has been created by the conduct that has caused the, re the result required as an element of the offense. In contrast, switching to the oncoming lane and causing the death of the occupants of a vehicle on that lane is never justified under German law in its interpretation held by the majority opinion, even though the intention of the driver or manufacturer of X um, with regard to the user was to avoid the death of the occupants of the vehicle at X. In the case of a human driver intending to avert the danger from themselves, a relative or a close person, a so-called necessity as defense under uh, section 35 of the criminal code can exonerate the driver so he's deemed to have acted without guilt. However, this concept is not applicable with the manufacturer who has installed a certain solution of the dilemma as the requirement of a personal relationship with the persons on board the car is usually not met there. Whether a guilt exonerating extra legal necessity can be adopted is very controversial in Germany and denied by most authors. In consequence, any programming that does involve switching the lane and killing third parties is illegal, although it might not be punished in very rare cases. Since legal scholars that share this majority opinion and, and politicians in Germany do not want to completely obstruct the development towards automatic driving, of course, they have been looking for ways to solve their, their dilemma. Some authors, such as my esteemed German colleague, Mr. Hilgendorf, have proposed to resort to the concept of the so-called permitted risk. I think we can move to the next slide now. Um, in case the manufacturer makes due efforts to ensure the safety of the system, um, minimizing the risk of physical damage. They argue that the situation can be compared to that with airbags, whose installation is deemed to be allowed in spite that it might cause the passengers or drivers injury or death in extreme cases. I do not share this view because in my opinion, the airbag issue is different from our dilemma situation. When it comes to airbags, it is about or you give up on equipping cars with them and risk that in many cases there will be severe damage to the driver or passenger, or you install them and take the risk that the passenger or driver is injured in a very small number of cases. So the consequences of the decision in favor or against the airbag installation affect the same person, that is the passengers. The cases we have been discussing here, however, are not only about taking or not taking the risk to harm the driver or passenger of the car concerned by the tour. In, fa in fact, when a harmful situation in it is inevitable, the machine is required to decide whom out of two or even more parties shall bear with the consequences. This means that the choice between different human beings is at stake. This latter question, that is, who can be legally sacrificed, is not answered, though, by resorting to the concept of the permitted risk in the way the mentioned authors want to solve the problem by just resorting to this concept without further specifications. Here is where the solution proposed by other authors like Tatiana Hörnle and Mr. Wallace comes in. They also want to tackle the problem by opting for the concept of the permitted risk, but, and that is the difference with the former view, 
According to them, it's only acceptable to apply the concept of the permitted risk, which results in the denial of the existence of the actus reus here, if beforehand an ethically acceptable set of priority rules for the dilemma situation has been set up by the manufacturers and they have programmed the cars correspondingly. In my personal opinion, this letter attempt to solve the problem sounds good at first glance, but is, is not able to change the legal evaluation held by the majority opinion in those cases where this preference rule violates the existing laws. This is exactly what happens, for instance, with regards to the preference rule set up by Mrs. Hörnle that prioritizes children over the elderly, and also with regards to the preference rule that consists in saving the larger number of people. Both rules are incompatible with current criminal law. Furthermore, with this in Germany, furthermore, with this approach, it remains unclear who shall be in charge to assess whether the preference rules are ethically acceptable or not. Some authors seem to feel that maybe the permissibility of the risk cannot only be based on a social consensus on what the preference rules should be, but might require something else. And that is an approval by a government authority. And here is where some start getting aware that such an approval that just ratifies social consensus might come into conflict with constitutional law. Um, now, now that I have criticized other approaches, you might want to know what my proposal to solve the problem is. In my opinion, um, the decision on how, on how to solve the dilemma can neither be entrusted to the manufacturer nor to the users of the cars. And I will skip the examples here why I think this is true. Um, as a consequence, um, my personal conclusion is that we have to create um, public law provisions, be it on a national level, that is administrative law, or within the EU on a supranational level, EU regulations, for example, on how cars should be programmed. Plus, these public law provisions should ideally be based in turn, in their turn, on requirements set up in international reg regulations. Such international requirements as contained, for example, in the UN ECE regulations that in their turn are referred to by the EU type approval regulations and thus have direct legal force in all EU member states would bring about the following effect. Programming the cars according to the requirements set out in the inter or supranational regulations respectively would not constitute the creation of a legally disapproved risk anymore. The result being that the harmful result caused the kicker could not be attributed to the manufacturer. In some, the manufacturer and users could not be held liable from a criminal law perspective here. It's evident that such requirements cannot be created at discretion, but would have to be compliant with higher ranking law. National laws would have to be compatible with the constitution, especially the fundamental rights, EU law with the treaties and the charge of fundamental rights, and international law would have to observe inter alia human rights. As a result of these reflections, I believe that future UN ECE regulations on automated systems will be the proper location for provisions regarding how to solve the dilemma in situations where collisions are inevitable. The reason, I think you should move to the next uh, slide, please. Okay. The recent uh, UNECE regulation on ALKS seems to be a step in that direction, as it already includes in extensive provisions addressed to the manufacturer on when a colli collision has to be avoided and when it is acceptable. Now, there will be big challenges with such a global approach. As a first step, and on a national level, we, that is, state governments, legislators, etc., must get aware of the fact that our own understanding of ethics is not necessarily shared on a global scale. So Germans will have to face the fact that their fiercely defended ban on offsetting um, Sashihiki um, Kanjo through Kotono Kinshi 
and the prohibition to sacrifice third parties that have not been involved, involved in the dangerous situation so far. Uh, might not be shared elsewhere. As you perfectly know, here in, in technologically advanced Japan, for example, for instance, many criminal law scholars have the utilitarian view that sacrificing a minor number of individuals in order to save a major number of lives is legitimate. Some German authors might dismiss this argument by simply attributing the differences in approach to a presumed cultural gap between collectivist Japan and individualist Europe. Whether this latter observation on social cultural differences be true or not, I want to stress that things are not as simple as that. Specifically, the German Constitutional Court's decision that declared an Aviation Security Act disposition that had allowed to shoot down a hijacked plane inconstitutional on the grounds that offsetting of lives and sacrificing innocent third parties infringed human dignity has been subject to severe criticism, for example, by also by many Spanish and Latin American authors whose culture and criminal law system are supposed to be even closer to ours. After having recognized that our own views and values are not necessarily universal, countries should, as a second step, get committed without being constrained by historical burdens or political interests to elaborating an adequate common denominator regarding the solution of dilemma situations, which would then be the basis for manufacturer binding provisions. So next slide, please. I do feel that there is some hope that such a common denominator and thus internationally uniform provisions might be reached since the German government did not adopt all of the very restrictive criteria the German Ethics Committee had proposed in its report in 2017 and that you can see here underlined on the slide. Next slide, please. Rather, the federal government in its 2018 action plan on how to implement this ethics committee report just declared its intention to adhere to the principle that property damage takes priority over personal damage, as well as to the prohibition to discriminate on the basis of personal traits, such as age, gender, etc. In contrast, it did not explicitly commit itself to the ban on offsetting, nor the pro prohibition to sacrifice bystanders, declaring that these aspects had to be subject of further assessment. What has happened since then? Next, last slide, please, or, or the, um, the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, only a few days ago, the Ger uh, German federal government adopted a draft bill that further amends the Road Traffic Act, introducing some provisions that tackle the issue of vehicles without, uh, with autonomous driving functions that are supposed to run without an onboard driver in defined areas only, stating the necessity to legislate on the matter without as long as there are no international requirements, it comes up in Australia with provisions on the technical requirements that these vehicles have to fulfill. Under its uh, section 1E, um, second paragraph, it establishes that the vehicle, besides having to be able to abide by traffic laws, um, has to be equipped with an accident prevention system that firstly is designed for damage prevention and reduction, secondly takes into account the importance of the different legal interests involved when harm is unavoidable for one out of two different legal interests, Hoeke being the protection of human life, the top priority, and thirdly, that the system does not resort to considering personal traits characteristics in a situation where there is an alternative risk for one or another life. Judging from these three requirements, it's clear to me that the German government did not include the ban on offsetting, nor takes up a stance on the issue of sacrificing bystanders. Could that the reason of being so reserved in this res could the reason of being so reserved in this respect be that the federal government does not want to anticipate future international negotiations on ethical guidelines, or might it actually give up on the ban on offsetting there? I don't know, and I leave you with that for the discussion. Thank you very much. Last slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I presume many have several questions, but please wait for asking her in the panel discussion. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, dear Takeyoshi, for, for your invitation. Um, I've tried to transcribe the, the state of, of French law uh, in a document that you, you, you've uh, received. Um, and uh, so if anyone wants to, to, to add this document, uh, please uh, share the, my, my paper. I would like um, to, to thank my colleague Aya Oshawa and Mrs. Caroline Le Breton for their precious uh, translation and, and help. Um, I won't be very long on the presentation of French law because everything is in my document. Um, I will simply uh, recall uh, essential principles so that I can then try to discuss the case uh, you proposed, the, the dilemma case. Um, in France, the first rules concerning autonomous vehicles date back to 2015, but the process has really been launched three or four years ago. And thanks to mobility orientation law, of December 2019, France is one of the first European countries with, with Germany to adopt a legal and regulatory framework allowing the circulation of autonomous vehicles. Um, to be clear, uh, today the mobility orientation law gives us only the legal framework to, to build the future of the French law of autonom autonomous vehicles. That's only uh, a beginning. Um, let me try to check what, okay, and the Tegon field is in English. Okay. Um, I was reading in this, I was trying to, to read in the same time the question on, on the chat, sorry. Um, to, to be clear, uh, today the, the that's only the, the foundation of the, of the law of uh, autonomous vehicle in French. This legal uh, framework is currently focused on the appearance of level three vehicles. This is a, a long way uh, from level five vehicles. Um, commercialization and marketing is not yet possible in France. We are in the testing uh, phase. Um, until now, road experiments involving autonomous vehicles have been subject to, to strict authorization by the authorities. The administrative authorization imposes several conditions for experimentation on the roads. Uh, firstly, the delivery of the authorization is subject to the condition that the system of driving delegation can, can be neutralized or deactivated by the driver at any time. This is the first condition. Um, the safety obligation is clearly placed on the company that seeks and obtains the, the authorization since the text states that the order of the authorization shall implement the necessary measures to remedy, remedy events that may affect safety. Um, that's uh, Article 10 of, of, the, of the law. In the event of a breach, uh, in addition to the risk of, of a fine, uh, the order is liable uh, to the withdrawal of, or suspension of the authorization. Um, another important condition is that an experimental ve vehicle uh, can only be put on the road with a driver who must be trained in automatic driving. Um, the occupants of the vehicle must be informed and authorized by the driver. We must also keep um, a sort of lock book, a black box in the onboard. The consent of the passengers must be given, which implies that minors, that's, uh, that kids, cannot for the moment travel under such uh, conditions. Um, so I tell you that the black box uh, system is also provided by, by the law in order to record the, the driving data. And as you can see, uh, the automated driving experience is just largely 
reminiscence of flying uh, airliners. Um, the mobility orientation law refers to the criminal uh, liability of the driver. That's a, the topic that interests us today. Um, this criminal liability, which is therefore not possible if the automatic system uh, is functioning. Uh, the criminal liability of the driver is possible uh, only after the driving system has been, um, sorry, the criminal liability of the driver um, uh, is impossible uh, that the principle, but it remains possible if the driving system has been shut, uh, shut off, uh, is, if the, the driving system has been uh, deactivated. To be clear, the responsibility of the human driver, of the, the human person, is only possible when he is in control of the vehicle. When the system is activated, the company that obtained the authorization, the order, is responsible. In the event of an highway traffic act violation, uh, if the system is functioning uh, normally, the order will be responsib re responsible for, for, for paying the, the fine, the criminal fine, and it may be imposed by the, for, the, for the violation. Um, in the event of a serious accident caused, the order is criminally, criminally liable. Um, underlying this, uh, this uh, criminal uh, responsibility, there is also the idea of civil liability, uh, since it is not clearly um, uh, right on the text, but it's understood that the action for compensation should be able to be directed against the order of the authorization, unless the driver has committed a fault, for example, by inappropriately uh, deactivating the automatic system. But this is only a transitional system. The rules should be different when autonomous vehicles will be put on the market freely without uh, prior authorization. Uh, the rule of criminal and civil responsibility will, uh, will have to be, I think, that's my opinion, clarified in, in, the, in the near fut future. Uh, before turning uh, your attention to the, to the case that uh, Professor Imai proposed, uh, a last important point must be seen, and it's concerning uh, data. Um, the mobility orientation of focus also on data. This is a, a strategic point for, for the future in, in, in France. Um, the law provides uh, for the adoption of measures concerning the accessibility of data to road infra infrastructure managers, police forces, and fire and rescue services to prevent or act in the event of an accident. This is Article uh, 32 of the law. But this data must also be able to be transmitted to road infrastructure managers for the purpose of knowing the road infrastructure, its condition, and its equipment. Um, although the law does not clearly specify it, it's also understood that the data may be used in the event of an accident, and particularly, especially, uh, by insurance companies. Um, so, as you can see, the, the legal framework is, is still very incomplete um, and French law is only building um, a foundation and many rules will have to be enacted, but that's, that's a good beginning, I think. Um, and you have all the, the, the information you need in my paper. So we are therefore still far from the hypothesis uh, put forward by, by Professor Imai, but um, so, let us uh, take a look uh, at the dilemma case, uh, the, the dilemma situation that uh, you propose, uh, dear Takayoshi, um, with some picture uh, first, um, to explain the, the French point of view. Um, 
for a French lawyer, this this kind, this type of dilemma is problematic because unlike American or English students in law, we we are used to working, we are not used to working uh, on the lifeboat case or on the trimway dilemma during our first year of, of college. That's not her edit. And it has to be said in French culture, we, we don't have an utilitarian uh, system. We, we don't have an utilitarian uh, legal framework. Um, rather, our framework is more a moralistic one, a Kantian uh, one. And we hate uh, making uh, this kind of calculations about uh, dead people. Um, can we excuse the death mm -hmm. of one cabin, uh, cabin sailor if it saves the life of two mm -hmm. others? Uh, is it necessary to save five lives by sacrificing two, two, two lives? Uh, the, these are questions that we hate uh, to ask uh, in the name of, uh, of morality. Um, it must also be said that French crime on a law does not does not give a clear answer to the dilemma uh, you, you, you asked, you posed, Professor mm -hmm. Imai. It is typically a, um, a hard case, to, to quote uh, uh, Dworkin, that will undoubtedly give a solution that is more moral than uh, strictly legal. Um, but there are some principles in the criminal, in the French criminal code, the code penal, that can help us. First, the, the rule, the first rule that no one is criminally liable except for his own act, of course. It means that the human passenger cannot be prosecuted if he or she was not the cause of the accident. That's, that's an evidence. Um, if the system was activated uh, during the accident, it is difficult to see all the human could be uh, prosecuted uh, unless he had regained the, the control with, for example, an alarm indicating danger, for example, and the, the obligation to, to retake, the, to regain the control of, of the vehicle. Um, a second important rule could come into play that is the state of necessity, the l'état de nécessité in French. Um, that means that in face of danger, uh, French crime on the law accepts that one causes harm to another if it is a, the, 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 the criminal code, if there is a proportion, if it is proportionate. The word question is here. Uh, what is the meaning of the word proportionate uh, being specified that in French law, in, in the French case law, um, we, the judge, uh, the judges uh, eight don't like to, to weighing, to, to take, uh, to, to put on balance the, the dead people. Um, the question also arises as to whether the, the driver of the machine can be excused if the victim or the victims uh, committed a fault by crossing, for example, the, the road on the wrong time when the, when the, the light is, is red. Uh, here again, the answer uh, under French law is not binary, it's not uh, mathematical. Uh, in principle, the victim's uh, conduct is indifferent uh, unless it is the exclusive cause of the damage. Uh, the question is then to know what is the exclusive cause. Um, the answer is neither mathematical or binary. Uh, it depends of, on the judge and it depends uh, on the facts. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, if humans are, are, are not responsible, responsible, the question arises as to whether we can prosecute the machine or the order uh, of the authorization. Um, in French law, the question is, is meaningless since artificial 
intelligence and more generally robots uh, have no legal personality, of course. It's impossible to prosecute an, uh, uh, an intelligent artificial. So the question is who is liable? Um, there is two answer, I think, to, to, to bring. It will be possible to prosecute the, the seller, the order of the authorization, if it's shown that the program has known a malfunction, um, if there is a violation of a security obligation, and the data on, on board of the vehicle on the black box then have to be exploited in this case to, to, to determine the, the cause of the accident. And if the artificial intelligence, the algorithm was improperly programmed, I think that the programmer could be, the writer of the program could be uh, prosecuted. That's a possibility. That's also a possibility, I, I think. Um, this leads to, to a last question um, that is how to program artificial intelligence to to deal with um, with this kind of, this type of situation um, should we program uh, the algorithm the algorithm to to make choices between the dead to make uh, this kind of binary choices i think that's that's my point of view that the question should mainly focus on that's, I think that's a wrong question for, for, for me. And I think that the question should mainly focus on how to avoid the, this kind of tragedies. Um, but if we uh, don't have to choose, if it's not possible, and if we need to, to program the, the algorithm, I, I believe that the answer cannot come from the, from the law and cannot come from the, the lawyers, uh, to be more pre precise. I think that it's... Um, a choice of ethics, that's a philosophic choice. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that I can answer uh, this, this kind of question. Um, that's, that's all for me. I will, I will be very happy to, to answer your, 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 your question. So thank you very much and arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Professor Loda. Um, thank you again for referring to the dilemma case and the interpretation of the necessity in France. It is very, very important for all of us. And again, let me propose that question time for you will be had later. Are you okay? Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. So um, could I uh, propose to all of you that uh, we will have the break, breaking time for about six or seven minutes? I mean, and 8 p.m. we will restart uh, this symposium. I mean, to restart the discussion panel. Are you all right? Okay. So, the members of the panel are going to restart at 8 p.m. So, you can 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 restart at 8 p.m.
まあ、まだですね、これからですね。うん、まあ、最初は自主感が全くなくなってきます。<笑><笑>彼女だけが時間のことです。OK、it's 8 p.m. in Tokyo, so could I ask you to restart our symposium?、Um, first of all, I, I would like to ask anyone who would like to ask questions and、uh, say their、uh, opinion to the speakers. I mean,、uh, all four have、uh, spoken to us very Important and very latest information regarding to the autonomous vehicle and、uh, how to、uh, reach the problems called dilemma case. Is there anyone who would like to first have your say? Uh, hello, uh,、yes. this is Ming Wei Fen from Taiwan. And、yes, I would like to、uh, express my appreciation to the host of this、uh, workshop as well as all the excellent presentations from the speakers.、Uh, well,、uh, because autonomous driving is、um, uh, you know, very、uh, new type of services, as many speakers mentioned that、um, there would be some unknown scenarios. As well as the definition of the responsibility of the liability if、uh, casualty or events happen. My question to the speakers are、uh, uh, Would it be considered the,、um, uh, to be the、uh, hybrid responsibility、uh, between the, um, the uh, operator, the natural? Uh, the, the owner of the vehicle or the system. And also, would it be possible in the future that the management of the system, as well as the roadside and communication services, should, might be also potentially responsible for the damage and cost?、Mm. And thank you.、Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very, very important question and your opinion. Is anyone among our speakers who would like to have your say to this very good question? s If I may? For example, for... yes, yes, Jessica, please. Hi, thank you for the very perceptive question. One of the big shifts and recommendations we are making in the legal system for the UK in dealing with road traffic incidents. Is to move away from a criminal law response in respect of accidents and instead focus on incident investigation and understanding what went wrong from a regulatory point of view.、Um, uh, so we think obviously the civil side of things, so compensation has to be given to victims, and that is done from a civil law point of view through insurance primarily under the scheme in the UK. So if an automated vehicle causes damage, Then the insurance company is primarily liable for the responsibility. But as you say, that does not itself resolve who is underneath that layer of compensation, who is actually accountable, even from a criminal point of view, and also to compensate、uh, with money.、Mm -hmm. So, what we are suggesting is setting up a specialist unit to investigate very difficult, high profile incidents. So, that is one way of dealing with. Um, accidents is having a fact finding、uh, body, a bit like in aviation. So that's one element that we suggest is really important. And the idea of having the regulator with very broad powers、uh, to take sanctions if something goes wrong,、um, to understand and analyze why it went wrong, and to be able to take measures to prevent it happening again. And having that be the emphasis of the system. And we are not proposing immunity from criminal、uh, sanction, but we just do not think it's particularly helpful when you are dealing with computers and algorithms which are managing the, the driving task. 
Uh, but we do think there is a, um, a, a role also more for corporate responsibility. Because I noticed there is, mm -hmm. uh, in our systems, very much an emphasis on blaming individuals. You know, now we do the driver, in the future it might be the technical supervisor or the software developer, and these are individuals. Um, I think one of the things we are hoping to help move towards is corporate accountability that can work better and better reflect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who has the best power to make a difference. I will stop there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But it's a very difficult and good question. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone would like to add something to the answer of Jessica? How is your opinion regarding to this question and answer? Yes, please, Roda. Uh, yes, maybe just just a precision. Um, I believe very much in the plasticity of the law and its adaptability. And I think that uh, even if we don't have um, a special uh, regime for for this kind of situation, the the law of the responsibility. That's the French uh, point of view. Is um, is soft uh, to to is, is adaptable to give answer to the future and to 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 give an answer to 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 this very interesting question. That I think that we in French in French law we look for. Who is the, the the solvent? Where is the money uh, to to find the answer to the responsibility question? Uh, and that's mm -hmm. probably give us some indication to 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 tell that the the probably the the seller, the company, um, the uh, will be liable in this kind in this kind of situation to to give a, a good compensation for for the for the victims. Okay, Ms. Wen, is it yeah. enough for you? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for the thank you. Uh, response. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other uh, opinion or question to the speakers? Or among the speakers, uh, if you, he or she would like to ask among us, could you do so? For example, Professor Hilgendorf has laid the uh, term uh, Haruta was a keeper of the vehicle. Uh, what kind of role uh, would the keeper should be uh, in the near future? And uh, Jessica has uh, answered it. Uh, how about your uh, comment or uh, opinion from Mirja and uh, Jean Christopher regarding to this point? I mean, the, the role who is expected to the keeper or the Haruta of the vehicle in the near future? A lot of aspects regarding to the civil liability has been spoken, but when it comes to the criminal liability, for example, in the England, in the UK or in Japan uh, and in France, uh, corporate criminal liability is exi existed. So this kind of scheme can be applied to the near future, but the things is very different in Germany. Okay. How do you think about it, Mirja? Um, hello. Uh, thank you all for your um, interesting um, contributions. Um, I think, yeah, in, in Germany, we're still discussing questions of uh, issues of whether an enterprise should uh, be held liable uh, from criminal perspectives and the legislator is not really moving uh, towards a really um, strict criminal liability, but uh, more something else. So, but I don't, don't want to enter this discussion now. Um, here, but I think um, there will be some possibility to hold the, um, a company that keeps the car liable and not the company itself, but the person are in charge of um, supervising this or, um, or the representatives. So that would be the, the um, German approach. And um, yeah, I think uh, there should be clear rules what the responsibilities are. Uh, last year, I had the chance um, to and honor to explain to you um, the civil and also, but also criminal liability of uh, the ones who are on board the car and in charge of taking over. 
and uh, for this problem the the legislator has set up a set of um, rules um, or obligations duties that uh, have to be observed by the um, person in charge let's say user in charge in this case um, who's like a hybrid between a driver and uh, a user and I think that was a quite a good approach although I would have preferred uh, a better distinction between um, level three and level four mm. such as it was also criticized mm. in the legislative progress mm. but i think something yes. uh, similar might be applicable to the keeper in the future mm. Mm. okay thank you may i ask a question uh, with your comment Professor Imai? yes on your oh, yes, excellent, please. yes on your excellent point about the holder and the keeper um, mm. because i understand that a lot of the responsibilities can be with this entity from our uh, research and discussions the idea of operating a self-driving vehicle that has no responsible human in it say carrying only passengers or empty it will be a very difficult task in practice, it will mm -hmm. uh, require uh, cleaning sensors in the right way and making sure they are calibrated uh, on an ongoing basis and um, downloading updates appropriately, not you know making sure it's actually been reflected uh, correctly. And at a very basic level, if a vehicle runs out of power, it is stuck in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. So it's not a problem with the ADS. But the actual vehicle, maybe a tire blew out or uh, the battery is out. Um, that's where, um, that's why from our perspective, we thought it would be useful to identify an entity that has singular responsibility mm -hmm. for this, that would need to meet requirements mm -hmm. and criteria of competency, of solvency, mm -hmm. um, rather than mm -hmm. uh, make it more about the individual vehicle. And because there are all these mm. aspects which are also very ongoing and the supervision element, which I understand also mm -hmm. is uh, very mm -hmm. much being thought of in every other jurisdiction, we quite like the idea of making a single mm -hmm. corporate entity liable for that because it is such a complex task overall um, mm. that to put mm. it on individuals um, that might not be, you know, uh, they, they might be technically competent, but there are many more things to it about customer service and it just feels like a huge mm -hmm. task to put on a holder, which currently is more like a formality, mm -hmm. at least in the UK, it's a formality. Sometimes even finance company can be the holder um, and have mm -hmm. never seen the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, it just feels like a, a complete mm -hmm. shift in our relationship with the vehicle. So that's why I just wanted to share. Uh, it's not so much from our point of view, the lack of clarity on the responsibility, but a real change in the function um, of what is mm -hmm. expected from a holder day to day. Um, so I just wanted to mm. offer that to our colleagues that um, mm. obviously uh, rely on that concept quite a bit. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, Osa先生,あの、消費者法の観点からフランス語でロダ先生にご質問なさってくれてもいいんですけど、I just asked to Professor Osawa to uh, what kind of question she has uh, with regard to the consumer protection law is especially imbuing the European as well as the French law. おさんあのフランス語で結構です。あ、フランス語で大丈夫ですか? <laughs> Ou bien, une achran spécial qui aura lieu pour voiture autonome, n'est-ce pas? Mais en futur, par exemple, les propriétaires de voiture autonome sera responsable parce qu'ils utilisent une chose danger, danger, comme, comment dire, accident circulation, par exemple, euh, franco-japonais. Mm -hmm. Si oui, ce qui est le plus problématique, est-ce les consommateurs? qui achètent des voitures autonomes, comprendre le risque de ce voiture, par exemple, notamment la responsa responsabilité civile ou criminelle. Merci Professeur Loda, please answer in French. <laughs> D'accord, ok. Um, uh, that's a very complex question, but I will try to do this in French, uh, but not in yes, Japanese. Yes, so. 
Euh, merci Aya. Euh, C'est une question difficile. Euh, je crois que euh, la réponse, euh, et, et comme le disait Jessica, euh, et, et c'est une tâche très difficile pour les juges parce que il y a beaucoup de paramètres qui rentrent en jeu euh, même si le véhicule est considéré comme une chose dangereuse je crois que dans un cas de responsabilité ce que feront toujours les juges c'est d'essayer de voir quelle est la, la cause première the, the proximate cause euh, qui a amené l'accident euh, s'il y a un défaut d'entretien dans le véhicule euh, si le véhicule n'a pas, si le, le software n'a pas été bien chargé, s'il y a un défaut d'entretien, euh, les juges se tourneront certainement vers l'imprudence du consommateur euh, et retiendront sa responsabilité. Si euh, le défaut est intrinsèque, euh, s'il n'y a pas de, j'allais dire, d'erreur humaine, d'erreur du consommateur et que l'on arrive à détecter euh, un, un défaut dans le, la programmation, un défaut dans, euh, dans le, la solidité de la voiture, les juges auront nécessairement tendance à, à, à ce moment-là, retenir la responsabilité euh, du, euh, du fabricant ou de, ou, ou de l'entreprise. Euh, L'hypothèse où il n'y aurait aucune responsabilité n'est pas socialement acceptable en droit français. Et les juges trouveront toujours un moyen, de toute manière, euh, de, euh, de se tourner vers, euh, vers, vers l'entreprise, je pense, parce que c'est là euh, qu'il y a de l'argent et qu'il y a des assurances et que l'objectif principal n'est pas tant de trouver le véritable auteur, mais l'objectif aujourd'hui dans la responsabilité française civile, c'est d'indemniser et de réparer. Yes, and in, in the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the simultaneous interpretation from French to English by uh, Karine. Thank you very much, Karine. Onsa-san, comment are you? Okay, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, again, uh, I will ask uh, to the four speakers. Among us, is there any other questions to further our understanding to the related matters? Just again. Yes, uh, if, uh, if I may. I'm fascinated yes. by the ethical uh, questions and implications. Mm -hmm. And I understand the trolley problem is often mm. described as unlikely to happen in real life, so maybe we don't need to worry as much about it. But something that I think is more likely and is very, the trolley problem illustrates it, is the redistribution of risk. So mm. currently in road traffic, we have humans at the wheel and they cause certain types of accidents when they are tired, drunk, distracted. Now, when we have automated vehicles, It, we have been very clear to say they will not do those things. They will not, we, we, at least for the moment, you know, maybe Elon Musk's uh, wonderful forays mm. into AI make it so human-like, it might make similar aspects, but not for the present time. But it might make different mm. types of mistakes. And if it makes different mistakes, it seems to me logical that there will be a different distribution of risk. So people that You know, maybe the kinds of accidents that might have happened today may not be the ones of tomorrow. And that will mean that you are choosing a certain different type of benefit. So you might, for example, reduce the overall number of deaths, but you might have a higher mm. proportion of deaths of a particular demographic or a particular type of road user if it's very difficult to detect e-scooters. Or one thing I was told by a developer, very interesting, was some sensors rely on leg movement to be able to differentiate pedestrians from others. So if you wear mm. a long skirt mm. or a robe in some of you know, different religions as well, it has impact on gender, religion, implication, you might mm. find system perform mm. less well for certain things or even skin mm. tone could make it harder to detect mm. um, you in mm. different situations. And um, how, and this is a question, I'm just sharing something that I think 
uh, we cannot mm. ignore because sometimes too easily developers might say the trolley problem is not mm. really a problem. It will not happen. We will prevent it. I completely mm. agree with what Jean Christophe was saying. We have to focus on that. But I think it would be not fully transparent to also say there will be a, a shift and a change. Um, and we need to let society mm. know um, what is happening and be transparent mm. with it. And I agree it's a political question, mm. but it has to be informed. And I, I what uh, Mirja was saying as well about the constitution, because it cannot just be political. Mm. There's also very important constitutional mm. questions. But yeah, I, I just think the ethical aspects mm. are impossible to ignore. Um, mm -hmm. I agree, yes. Well, uh, it is very, very interesting uh, opinion of Jessica, and uh, I've, um, almost I agree with her. And uh, could I ask uh, to have a German partner to discuss what to compare the, the key concept, which Jessica said, as a uh, distribution of the risk and the uh, allowed it risk in German criminal law theory. I mean, that's Erlabutis, Erlabutis, this this call and the, and the, or the Apulu allowed it, this disk is very similar for me to the distribution of the disk to, uh, uh, to rescue the person who will be afraid of being sued criminally. So uh, Professor Hilgendorf, if, if, if you, can understand what I would like to ask you. Could you just to give us a, a specific a, a viewpoint of the how Erlaubutes Disco is very important in German criminal law theory? Yes, I will try. It's an interesting discussion, especially what Jessica just said. It's fascinating. We had a lot of talk about this in. Um, when it comes to um, AI systems in general, it's called the mm. bias problem. Yeah, some yes. machines may be biased and we don't realize it. That's, um, um, uh, I think, a good point. And uh, um, maybe I say I could say some words to this bias problem and then some words to the allowed risk problem. Uh, this bias problem um, arises even though these machines may function perfectly. Yeah, they, th these machines, um, um, consider the facts of the past um, or they, they consider the facts that are given to them, the input, and then they make certain prognosis. And this may function perfectly. Nevertheless, um, the outcome may be thought of uh, as problematic as Jessica's example is qu quite uh, interesting. Uh, let's have an, let's say a, a kind of um, collision avoidance system that reacts when, uh, the, when the sensors detect two legs moving. Yeah? So the system mm. is maybe functioning perfectly whenever there are two legs in the direction of the car, the car will swerve aside. And maybe the programmers don't think about people wearing long shirts <laughs> or using a bicycle or so, yeah? and the car will go, go on and, and hit them. Uh, this is a problem that should not be underestimated. Um, I believe um, it's we, we as lawyers should make the uh, technological people responsible for the functioning of their machines. Mm -hmm. So this this bias problem mm -hmm. is not something uh, uh, that's only a theoretical thing, but it's uh, it can be really can really have discriminatory effects, and therefore the law is uh, necessary to stop that. Yeah? So and we can do it by liability mm -hmm. regulation. The car is not able to. Mm -hmm. To, to, to realize that the bicycle is in front of it, mm. the car, or mm. if a woman with a long mm. uh, 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 sh shirt or so is in front of the car, then uh, the, the, this, uh, it's a fault, it's a problem for the, for the car. Uh, um, I think so there are technological solutions to that and there are uh, also uh, legal solutions to that. And this brings me to this idea of allowed risk is also an old, very old uh, idea in, in legal history mm -hmm. and in over Europe. And the basic idea is no technologically, no technology is perfect. There will also be that always be damages. Yeah? Um, if you mm -hmm. if you use a bicycle, some someday the bicycle will go uh, uh, be out of order and there, something will happen. If you use a spoon, yeah, the spoon may break and hurt you. Yeah? And, uh, wherever you use 
uh, artificial uh, entity, um, it can produce a bad effect. If the law, yes, would say, you, the producer of this spoon, you are responsible criminally or mm. civil law, and nobody would go on producing mm. spoons. That would be a problematic situation for a society. So if, mm. we want to, if we want to have technology, if you want to have artificial intelligence, mm. we have to accept a certain level of risk. Yeah? That's a general idea. Mm. And the problem is, of course, what level of risk we, are, we want to accept. Mm. I believe there are mm. interesting cultural differences uh, here. Yeah? The Americans tend to accept, so tend to be willing to accept enormous risks um, and, and would say no problem. Uh, maybe the Japanese from the opposite uh, uh, mm. uh, position have the opposite position uh, risk as low as possible. That's why Japanese mm. cars are so good, so safe. Uh, if you want to have a really mm. safe car, you should buy a Japanese car because mm. the Japanese public would not accept dangerous cars. And maybe the Germans and the French are in between. Yeah? And mm. this acceptance is also uh, uh, something that uh, depends on your on your uh, on your age. Young people tend to be more willing to accept risks than older elderly people, and so on and so on. And this aspect mm -hmm. should be discussed. And they have also, of course, a kind of um, um, result in in law. In, in, for example, in criminal law, we have long said that um, when it comes to decide whether there is negligence or no, a certain a certain um, uh, 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 risk has to be can be accepted, and we won't say this producer of the spoon acted negligently simply because he produced the spoon. We would say you have to make the spoon as good as you can, and if that's okay, mm -hmm. we will accept remaining risks. Yeah? That's a basic idea, and these basic ideas also hold good in the area of artificial intelligence and the area of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, automotive cars. And now it's up to us mm -hmm. as lawyers to define mm. how much risk we want to accept. And maybe this is not a national thing that can mm. be decided by the British or the French alone, even though mm. I would really love to follow them. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, something that has to be decided uh, on an international scale because te technology also is international today. Technology will affect mm. all of us and therefore maybe we have a, mm. a universal uh, level mm. of risk yeah thank you very much thank you very very impressive so Mirja, you can i i, I think you can uh, uh, compare the differences or the similarities between the uh, of the culture between germany and in japan because you have a lot of experience in staying in japan so um i agree uh, if if i if i may takayoshi just yes. uh, it was very interesting yes, thing to 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 hear from eric and I think is is totally right that the question of acceptance of of the risk, but I wonder the fact is that we will um, driving dangerous products and the the, the the question in the near future is the mm. the amount of insurance, and uh, it is expected to be uh, very high. And, and for me, the, the real question is: Will the 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 cars, the autonomous vehicle, be accessible? to everyone because the cost of the insurance, because that's a fact, it will be dangerous to drive uh, on the road in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, very difficult question to answer. Yes. Is anyone would like to try to answer his question? This car? Um. Yes, yeah, so um, the main use case that we think we might see in terms of uh, more fully automated uh, technology is in respect of ride hailing type technology. So that would be absorbed within a much bigger service of vehicles. But I agree, I think um, the, uh, the, the technology will possibly attract higher premiums, but there might be some partnerships. We know a lot of the insurance companies in the UK are part of the consortia that are helping bring the technology to market. So if they are very well aware of the risk and in partnership with different developers, they may not exact mm. such high premium because they have a long-term 
you know, a longer term view of the benefits that they may reap. And they might also have access to data, which is another favorite topic, isn't it? Mm. So they might um, be able to offset some higher costs and accepting mm. higher risk on the one hand by having much better data uh, on the vehicles. I'm just mm. suggesting some possibilities, but I don't have the answers. I, but it's, I think it's a great point and uh, it will be interesting to see how mm. things evolve. Mm. Mm. Well, in, in Jessica, in, uh, sorry, minute, please. Yes. No, no, I, I just wanted to comment something on uh, what uh, Eric uh, Hilgendorf said. Um, I basically mm. agree um, with the, the statement that there are cultural differences between um, Japan, America, and uh, for example, Europe when it comes to taking risks. But I think there's also mm. one factor that we should not uh, forget. It depends on the outside pressure we have, on the circumstances we have. We can see that now very well with Corona, I think, with COVID, mm. because some, mm. I think, for example, the Americans usually were very, I mean, their um, federal agency for um, uh, allowing medication um, is um, supposed to be super strict. And in the case of COVID, they have been. Um, more relaxed because they had a really big out external pressure to solve that big problem uh, COVID, COVID has caused in the United States with so many victims, um, with so many people dying. And for example, I could imagine that demographic reasons such I could observe in Japan mm. when I was there three years ago um, uh, in a hospitation program with the uh, Supreme Court of Japan, there I saw that there were very many cases with elderly people involved in traffic accidents. So they um, they drove a car and then they crashed into somebody. And maybe this kind of demographic problem, uh, evolution that you have a society that is made up of, a, of many, many elderly people that have the the wish to continue moving between cities, etc., within cities. And um, you want to respond to that on the one hand, but on the other hand, you want to, to make traffic safer, then maybe the, the balance is another one. Maybe then you have to give in a little when it comes to um, the, secure, the, the details of security in the, in the automatic vehicle, just to have a, a better overall security because there are too many accidents happening with people still driving at the point of time when the technology maybe is not totally developed and still the overall balance might be better in this kind of society. So I'm, I think there are many factors that influence uh, on the question what kind of what kind of risk we take. Yes, yes, thank you. So, um, well, um, all of us, among the speakers and me are also uh, at referring to how we can or should compare the pressure of having a car and the anxiety for the trajectory uh, result. Do you uh, count it by, for example, uh, taking the cost analysis mathematical standard as just Jessica referred to in her presentation? And I personally would like to choose this kind of uh, very mathematical standard, but for example, Jan Kursov uh, doesn't want to use this kind of uh, standard in France, and maybe uh, Eric and Mirja don't want to use it. Is my understanding correct? Jan Kursov? Sorry, may, sorry may I ask, okay, Jessica, what yes. do you mean by mathematical uh, standards? Well, uh, yes, the cost for preventing the accident on one, one, hand, one side and, uh, and the benefit by using uh, sometimes dangerous vehicle. Oh, yes. I, I would just wish to clarify. Uh, we think that is one element of the equation yes. and we should be clear mm -hmm. uh, about it. But uh, we think you also need the other element, you know, other ways of assessing risk, you know, including yes, yes, comparing that's with right. the yes. competence. They're not on its own. Um, so I think we would not be yes, that's, um, I agree. Yes. comfortable with just mathematical um, it was just a mathematical yes. model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, John, uh, if I please. can, uh, if I can un un answer the, the question, um, uh, to be clear, uh, there is no mm. utilitarian calculation by the judge, the judge in French, 
that's not our mm -hmm. culture. The French, to be clear, don't like Bentham. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't read Posner. Uh, they don't <laughs> like uh, Stigler. Uh, mm -hmm. And they don't study him. So to be, and uh, we like Kant. We like uh, the German moralist authors, mm. and we have a moral approach to to the law. Um, and if someone someone dies, we have to make. Um, it, it's not a question of calculation. Every life counts for us, for for the mm. judge. And uh, the answer of the judge is to find the responsible, uh, a responsible, mm. a, li a liable um, entity. Mm. And we will always look for a causal link uh, with the tragedy. Um, but uh, it's impossible for a French lawyer to have this kind of utilitarian, mathematical, binary approach. It's mm. morally impossible. Could you tell us the, the reason of it? I mean, uh, is there any kind of uh, di differential uh, uh, tendency among the jury? Well, I, I don't think so. The, the main reason to, to answer your question is, is, is uh, mainly cultural. Mm -hmm. That's uh, because we, 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 are, we are not common lawyers. Mm. We don't believe in Bentham. Mm. Okay, that's the main reason. That's not a legal reason. That's a that's a cultural reason. And I think mm. in 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 comparative law, the, mm. the, mm. the, the, ma the main important thing is culture. Okay, precisely. okay, precisely. Mm. Yeah, probably Jessica and I are a kind of hybrid lawyers between the continental and the common law lawyers. So because that's the, the reason maybe uh, why both of us our opinion are very different from others okay sorry um to Can the I audience something yes to please that? yes yes um i think one of the challenges is i understand many of these systems will be probabilistic they operate on probability of risk that's yes. just how they function so when 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 a, and i think there's different elements um there's a difference i think as jean christophe was saying when a judge looks at a fait accompli to use a, a french uh, word of something that has already occurred compared to a regulator that has to decide if a vehicle should be allowed on the road to begin with that is the first question that we're going to have to face when we go beyond trials that are just happening and that safety case may well give you a probability of risk. It will have to give you some data about its performance and that will not be a 100% track record. It's impossible. Like Eric was saying, no, no technology is 100%. It's, it's even a perfectly functioning one. So then we need to, we cannot avoid the question of saying, well, how much risk is enough? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is something that we just need to face. And I think one of the really difficult aspects which I agree, mm. harmonization internationally mm. is a good thing. Mm. But even mm. attending any meeting at the UN, you see there are so many different points of view and all of us can relate to that when we travel. There are such mm. strong differences among mm. countries. And the road safety I expected when I was in Nepal, you know, like going on a bus on a, on a you know, small uh, lane on a, on a bend on a mountain is not what I expect, you know, in London and is not what mm. I'm sure is, you know, in China. And uh, we have very different fatalities on the road. And, you know, in America, they accept more fatalities than they do in the UK. You know, it just happens. It's just the way it is. You get a license much younger, whatnot. And it would, a tech, the same technology, the same performing technology could maybe halve the deaths in one country and it could double the deaths in another. If you go to Scandinavia where they have great, you know, road mm. safety, the same technology might make a worse outcome for them but that same technology could make it much better somewhere else. And I think having a uniform standard is difficult because culturally it's going to be implemented in different places. And I, I just think, yeah, that's a, a big challenge to any harmonization. It's, it's hard nationally, but it's also very difficult internationally. Maybe I can add something here, uh, So this, uh, of course, this discussion uh, about Bentham versus Kant is, fascinating, but certainly we should mm. also consider Voltaire yeah, to make it fair. Uh, I, I would say yeah. that um, uh, you, you can measure risk now. Today, uh, different from the times of Kant, uh, you can measure risk, you can analyze risk, 
you can work with uh, the mathematics of risk. The insurance companies do it. Of course, also insurance companies in France and in, in Germany, they do it uh, in detail. Um, mm -hmm. um, one problem I was uh, uh, concerned with, or I had to consider was um, how to put more precision to the idea of accepted risk. And one possibility might be to consider the probability of, let's say, being killed by a lightning stroke uh, in, in Germany. If you walk around in Germany, I was said that the probability that you are killed by a lightning stroke from the sky is one to 10 million. And nobody cares much about it. So people seem to accept the risk of one to 10 million. And this means if you have a mm. car that will be able to um, um, function uh, uh, with a risk of one to 100 million or so, uh, or the, the danger to be killed by such mm. a system yeah, is less than the danger to be killed by a lightning stroke. If you argue rationally, you could say this should be mm. accepted because everybody accepts the risk of being killed by a lightning stroke. Therefore, you should accept the risk of um, uh, this car uh, as well. This shows how you can use uh, mathematics, very simple mathematics. <laughs> I accept mm. that in uh, the discussion mm. on uh, allowed risk. And um, uh, the, the professional people, the technology people, can do this in far more detail. Yeah? Uh, and I, I would say this is a very important aspect uh, because today you can measure risk, you can argue with risk. And th the big problem is that lawyers like me, for example, um, and most normal people are not trained in risk analysis mm -hmm. and they tend to be behave quite irrationally towards risk. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. risks we accept and it's from an objective mm -hmm. perspective, it's mad. And some risks we won't expect, even though the risk is very, very low. Uh, so this problem is also mm -hmm. a problem of education. I think also ed mm -hmm. education. So in addition to better law and better technology in the area of uh, autonomous yes. driving, you have also to have better education of, uh, of the population. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, there is a very important question from the audience. You can see in the chat room, and uh, let me read it. Maybe this is for the major. Well, uh, from our colleague from Mr. Hiraoka, he says that considering the background of the different, different, different social norms and regional characteristics in which automated driving will be used, it will not be easy to establish the standard of ethics. Uh, ethics. And, and instead of the standard of performance quality. So I would like to hear your opinions, maybe to Mirja. I saw. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, um, so I'm trying to understand the question. Yes. What does it mean? Um, uh, could could he clarify the question? What does it mean instead of the standard of performance quality? He, uh, he he said that uh, he he has heard that the ISO has started a movement to establish the standard of ethics for automated driving, but uh, he's afraid of being able to do so, uh, in considering the very big differences of the cultural background in many countries. So I also yes, I, like, yes, please. No, I was just wondering what, what, what instead. Um, um, okay, I I think it's uh, in fact um, difficult to uh, set out um, harmonized standards, uh, mm -hmm. just as uh, Jessica also pointed out. But I I I, I uh, w in my um, presentation I said that um, it's not maybe about finding one common standard that is. 100% the same everywhere, but it's about uh, finding a common denominator, like um, common basic rules, because I think there are common basic rules in traffic now worldwide. There are some differences, but the basic thing, how you run a car, except for this, on which side you move maybe, the basic things are basically the same. So I think it, it, it must be possible to reach um, some sort of basic 
common de denominator here. And I, I also think that we should not to, we, it, it's more about getting conscious also in different countries that our own solutions regarding this te new technology might not be ideal because maybe because maybe we have to leave like our um, uh, the comfort zone and try to think about other approaches, for example, about Bentham <laughs> or when we're in France or about um, some Kant when we're in the UK. So because I think we should not stay narrow minded and limit ourselves to our traditional thinking, but we should um, take these new technologies as a chance to to develop mm -hmm. ourselves, mm -hmm. to develop societies, and develop um, harmonized norms. And I think that that can only be reached if we have a broader uh, horizon and uh, uh, and open ourselves to other solutions that might, for this special problems, be uh, superior to the ones we have traditionally followed. That is a little bit what I wanted to say. It's not about getting rid of all our traditions, just to mm. try to okay. innovate. Mm. Thank you. Uh, maybe, he says that maybe, he can't uh, use. Uh, okay, please. Oh, yes, Jan. Sorry. Just to answer to 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 Mircea, uh, maybe it's because I'm a pessimistic lawyer, but um, <laughs> yes, I, I I think that it would be very very difficult to find a common standard and um, it was impossible uh, uh, to find a common frame concerning contract law in Europe uh, so uh, imagining uh, imagine oh sorry uh, to imagine um, a common frame concerning uh, this kind of very sensible question I think it will be a uh, very difficult it's difficult in France it's not only a question of tradition of course it is but it's difficult because you are right, Mirja, when we were talking about the COVID. I think in France, we have seen that the, with the COVID, it is clear that the risk is not well accepted in France today. Um, and it's also very difficult because it's a, it is a political question in France because we have mm. uh, guarantee funds, mandatory insurance, and everyone pays. That's a question of taxation, of tax. And that's why it's uh, it's so difficult to 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 answer the this um, very sensible question of of ethic and uh, common responsibility. But thank you for thank you very much for for, for your okay. thoughts. Is there any question or opinion from the audience? Uh, okay, let me use the short time for asking to Professor Hirugendorf regarding to the very impressive bill of uh, amending the Strauss and Fair Cares Act in, in Germany. Uh, you referred to the, the concept of the technical supervision. Um, is the technical supervisor deemed to be a driver? This is my first very basic question. Okay, it's only one question. Yes, it yeah, no, no, no. And the other is, um, uh, I looked for the definition of the risk minimizing state, but so far, I'm afraid I couldn't find it in the bill. Yeah. So uh, uh, as far as I understand, you kindly explained to us uh, what the risk minimizing state means in the draft, but I would like to check the definition of it. Two, two questions, please. Yes, I will. Okay, the microphone is on. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and the so first one. Yeah, the, the technical first supervisor. One the driver. The driver is a technical. No, the technical. The technical supervision is not the driver. A uh -huh. driver is, uh, is a, a person and a human person and, and, um, that that holds a wheel and is able to control the movements of the car. Yeah, that's the driver. And um, the technical uh, supervision is uh, uh, also a natural person, but this natural person only supervises the movement of the car and mm. only in ca cases of need, uh, it can bring the car to a mm. stop or it mm. can uh, decide which direction the car should, uh, mm. should go. And um, the technical uh, supervision 
is uh, the task of the holder or keeper. This gives me the chance to say a few words on this concept, which is mm. central in, uh, in the German uh, system, mm. other than in England or Great Britain. Um, it's a keeper who is responsible for, um, uh, for the safety and security and for, uh, is responsible for everything. This is already uh, existing law. So if an accident happens, the keeper has to pay. The driver maybe also, mm. but the key, basically the keeper has to pay. And all keepers of cars in Germany have to have an insurance. Therefore, we, we have mm. this insurance uh, uh, solution already. Everybody has to have an insurance and the insurance mm. then will pay money to the victim. And this system, obligatory insurance plus responsibility mm. of the keeper functions very well so far. And it functions independent of uh, the autonomy level of the uh, car. So even level five systems could fall under this uh, regulation, which is a happy thing, I would say. Mm -hmm. So in civil law, we don't have many, many uh, problems. Uh, it's different in, in, in criminal law. Yeah? So, so um, mm -hmm. um, therefore, I think the um, uh, idea of uh, the government to, to keep on putting the main blame on the on the uh, 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 keeper, on the holder, or in other words, uh, to hold the keeper responsible. Uh, also in this, uh, this new uh, uh, system, I think it's a clever idea. It's a good, a good way of, of, of uh, solving uh, things. And um, 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 we'll see whether uh, um, the, the keepers will be able to find natural persons really willing to take over this task because it's not a problem of civil law, it's a problem of criminal law. Criminal law you cannot get rid of. Yeah, so it could be very dangerous uh, to, to, to be personally in control of, uh, of the traffic, but we'll see whether, what will happen. And the, 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 the next question, what is a minimal risk state? Yeah, I think that's what was your question, yes. what, is this, what is this? I would, I would say um, the, um, it's the situation of the car that is, that poses the the, uh, um, uh, the the least risk. Yeah, there. Are, if the if a car is on the street, it can move to different spots, and uh, on each spot there there might be a different risk of further accidents. Yeah, and uh, the the point mm -hmm. of minimal risk is the point where this risk is minimized. That's how I would interpret uh, this uh, um, uh, regulation if, if I were a lawyer. Yeah, so so I think it's an, an thank you very much. A simple, a simple idea. Yeah, the, this autonomous car is moving. It's uh, this, this shuttle maybe mm. is moving on the street. All around it are different cars: mm. Mercedes and Toyota and, mm. and American cars and so on. Yeah, and then there's a problem. Sometimes a problem. The car via a radio gives information of the problem to the technical supervisor, and then. The mm. technical supervisor says a big problem, maybe the battery is, is low or so, big problem, bring the car to a stop at once. Yeah, and uh, if you take this literally, this would mean an obstacle in the midst of the street, which is nonsense. So the car somehow has to move to a place, to a spot where it can come to a halt without uh, uh, creating uh, unnecessary risk. And the, 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 the term, the term uh, minimum risk state means exactly that place, that's, that spot where the car can come to a stop without uh, producing too much risk. I think uh, it's, it's, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, you can do a lot of, uh, uh, I could, if I had time, I, I could produce a lot of problems for this concept as a criminal lawyer, as a professor, we are trained in producing and finding problems. But I, yeah. I, I clearly understand the idea of a lawgiver. And I would say, in, in principle, this idea is uh, a good idea. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, I'm afraid to say the closing time is uploading now. So I will let Mr. Satoshi Kamadar the executive director of the EAS gives us some closing remarks. Mr. Kamada, please. Eh, Imai Sensei, I'm a good person. 
えー、私あの、国際交通安全学会の専務理事の鎌田と申します。えー、今日はあの大勢の皆様にあのご参加いただきまして、本当にあ,のありがとうございます。I'm Satoshi Kamada, Executive Director of International Association of Traffic and Safety Sciences, IATS,、uh, which is the organizer of the symposium.、Uh, thank you very much for participating in the symposium of the research project led by Professor Imai. And I would also like to express my、uh, respect for the wonderful contributions of the panelists from Europe European countries. And this time it was held、uh, online, but、uh, I think uh, uh, we were able to have a, a fruitful time and nice discussion. It was great、uh, that、uh, some people, many people,、uh, participated in the discussion. Uh, with regard to autonomous driving,、uh, efforts for implementation are progressing in many countries, and technical issues and social needs have become clearer to, to an extent, as told in the symposium.、Uh, in response to such progress,、uh, legal systems have also begun to advance in some countries. I feel、uh, it may require. Complex and、uh, step by step、uh, responses. And、uh, the approaches, approach will be different among countries. On the other hand,、uh, transportation and、uh, manufacturing is、uh, very much global itself. I think uh, uh, the need for international cooperation and、uh, harmonization will increase in the process.、Uh, we may be Uh, only at the first entrance stage. And、uh, I think it is important to continue information sharing and discussions in various ways, including this kind of、uh, symposium.、Uh, lastly,、uh, I would like to express my gratitude again to all those who cooperated. Thank you very much indeed, everyone.、Uh, this, and this is the end of symposium. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 えー、ご聴講いただきましてありがとうございます。あの以上であのシンポジウムはあの終了とさせていただきたいと思います。あのミーティングからの退出をよろしくお願いします。えー、Could you please、uh, exit from the meeting? Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Kaneda. Thank you. ありがとうございます。So, in this sense, I'm really looking forward to have a similar symposium with you in the near future, just he said. Until then, autonomously keep connected. And thank you again for participating today. Goodbye to all.